That's our source, Jesus. Amen? Yep. Abiding in him, he abiding in us, we bring forth much fruit. Apart from him, we can do nothing. Can't get it done. But in him, we can do all things. Amen? Yep. Amen. It would be very fruitful in him, abiding in him, in that relationship with him. That, that's a relationship that just continues to grow and flourish, isn't it? We get closer to him as we, as we spend time with him, as we obey him, feeding upon his word and exercising ourselves in the, the application of his word, uh, growing in a sensitivity to his spirit, allowing ourselves to be led and directed by his spirit. We are abiding in him, and he is abiding in us. Amen? The word of God dwelling us, in us richly. We're fruitful in every good work. Our character changes. We take on the, the fruit of the Spirit as, as our nature, don't we? And we conduct ourselves in the relationship that we have with one another in a Christ-like manner. Not in a Jim-like manner. Amen? In a Christ-like manner. We become more like Jesus in every way. And we bear much fruit. And God is glorified in that fruitfulness. Hallelujah. Who else has one? Marianne. Psalm 111, 10. The fear of the Lord is his commandment. His praise is Psalm 111, 10. Great. Thank you. There we were talking about the fear of the Lord and obedience. Those two are really inseparable, aren't they? Yep. We fear God and we keep his commandments. As the preacher said, that's the whole duty of man. Who else has one? Anybody else? Micah, please. Amen. I knew you could do that. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He is our strength. Amen? Yes. He is, the Lord is our strength. And through him we can do all things. All that we've been called to do. All that he has ordained for our lives. That's what we understand. Amen? Yep. Anything that God has called us to do, if we are abiding in him, in that relationship with him, then we can do it. It might seem uh, like a formidable task to... Uh, have been uh, chased out of uh, Pharaoh's household, out of fear of death, been gone for 40 years, and then to come back and tell that same Pharaoh, the, the next Pharaoh, um, the guy who's in charge now, right? Um, Yul Brenner, I think it was, right? <laughs> Let my people go. Uh, they're the most powerful civilization on the face of the planet at the time. And Moses has been a shepherd for the last 40 years. And he comes on and he says, Thus saith the Lord, let my people go. Interesting Pharaoh's response, wasn't it? I don't know this God of yours. By the time it was all said and done, he had learned a few things about him. He sure had learned that the God that Moses was representing was a whole lot more powerful than any god that they worshipped and served, had created there in Egypt. Moses went in the power of God. He acknowledged his own inability. I can't, can't, can't speak. <laughs> and God says, I will be with your mouth. And it'll be with yours. It'll strengthen you, guide you, give you a mouth and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to gainsay or resist. Amen? You can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Hallelujah. Well, we're going to take some time. Um, guys, you can come and start rearranging the furniture for this week. Memory work. Let's do the Mark 10, 15, and 16. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms, put his hands upon them, and blessed them. That's Mark 10, 15, and 16. And then let's do Matthew 18, verse 6. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones, which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Just a sobering reminder of the responsibility that we have before our brothers and sisters. And yes, before the little ones. Amen? Amen. Matthew 18, verse 6. 
in between services, I was talking with a couple. We'll be probably finishing up here a little on the early side this afternoon. Make sure everybody's got ample time to get themselves ready and down to Virginia, talking with a couple in between. They, uh, they weren't so sure that they were going, but after we talked, they were, they were reconsidering. I was glad to hear that. Anybody else that might not be sure that you're going down? <clears throat> well, you can reconsider between now and, ah, uh, you know, 5 o'clock. Guys, you can come on up. <clears throat> on that, uh, the opportunities that we have to get together with our brothers and sisters there in Sterling are pretty limited. And we want, you know, valuing the relationship that we, we as we do, we want to avail ourselves of the um, opportunity. One jokingly, as I was talking about going, one jokingly said, well, I heard a, a good report last Sunday. Yep, so did I. Yep, and I'm sure there'll be plenty more good reports. I would encourage you along those lines, use the opportunity over the next number of weeks to, you know, get some time with Jim, Deanna, Bill, and, and ask some more questions about the trip. But it's not, uh, our time this evening isn't just about the, uh, the trip. Though it is very important for us to keep in mind that uh, those bodies of believers there are very much our brothers and sisters. I was talking with Marianne yesterday who had been talking with Emily yesterday, who had been talking to somebody else who had gone on the trip yesterday, and they said how impressed they were with how much they are among family when they're fellowshipping with the saints there at the churches in Kenya. And if you've not had occasion to uh, be on that trip, um, then you wouldn't know just how real that is uh, and it's very, very special to, to be talking with people you've never met before, but there is such a sense of, of being of one heart and one mind. Having been brought up uh, under the same teaching, the same emphases, uh, you know, they, they, um, they know what's going on here. They're, you know, they're listening to Pastor Scott's teaching. Of course, you know, they've, they're, they're in uh, regular contact. The pastors there are in regular contact with Pastor Rob, Pastor Forb, and, um, and so there's that, that, uh, uh, <clears throat> those relationships that, that uh, work to uh, build this bond of oneness. And um, it is, uh, it's, it's precious to see just how much the Lord does make us one. Uh, keep those works in prayer. Uh, give faithfully to the mission's uh, work. We send, and have for a good long time, we send 1200 per month from this fellowship, from your giving, to missions. There, there are expenses on the foreign field, as you can imagine. Um, it's not just, a, it, that doesn't go toward the missions team going every year. No, that's just, that supports some, those guys over there coming back from time to time. Um, uh, Jim, you might know, uh, do we financially support um, each of the African pastors, at least to some degree? Uh, do you know if, if uh, all of them? There was just a little change there, and I don't, I think um, in part. In part? Yeah. But I Again, I sure. I know that you understand that, um, that in the past, uh, the pastors there of the Kenyan churches, were supported by monies, largely by monies that were coming from the U.S., from this church, ch Church in Sterling. Um, <clears throat> but some years ago, they were encouraged to transition to, be, to being self-supporting. And um, that, uh, that has taken place, but I think that maybe, um, yeah, maybe sometime or maybe to a limited degree, um, Apparently, more recently, there is at least some support that comes from here to the pastors there. Um, but no, those are congregations that are, at least for the most part, self-supporting. Yeah. Uh, you'll hear pastors speak of, uh, uh, and, and others as well, probably, just about how, how blessed he was, uh, again, to see firsthand the works, the, the maturation, the strength of those uh, groups, those fellowships, their overseers. And uh, just to be able to come away with a, a full confidence that for any reason, uh, our men there, Forb, Rob, weren't able to be there in Kenya any longer. Those churches do just fine 
under the oversight of the Holy Spirit, Jesus as their Lord. The, the men that are pastoring there are men of God, called of God, ordained of God, very capable of bringing very good care to those flocks there. Privileged to be able to work with such good men, good men who have a heart for the Lord, have a heart for the people of God. I started to say, though, that our trip down for a Sunday evening such as this is, is not just for a missions report. It's to, you know, just to maintain the relationship that we have with, with our brothers and sisters there in Sterling. You get there and you find them, they're a lot like us. People of like precious faith. I'm being a little bit joking there. A little bit of a joke there. They are, um, they are precious brothers and sisters. And um, we uh, greatly appreciate the... Uh, the opportunities to get some fellowship with them. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, we, in our home fellowship group meetings there on Friday, we talked <clears throat> on the topic. What was the title of that thing again? What was it? Compel them to come. Compel them to come. Thank you. From the Luke passage. Plenty of people got excuses, don't they? They make excuses for themselves. Christians don't make excuses. They don't. Mm -hmm. No, they don't make excuses why they couldn't, why they can't. Did I share this one? One, one, of, one of my students here, one of the students here, um, the youngster's got a good sense of humor. Did I share this one with you? I, I, it, was, um, it was a couple weeks ago. I was in class filling in, and um, I gave one a small assignment. Uh, the other kids had finished it up in class. And... Um, and um, this individual, good sense of humor. I'm sure it was not intended to be taken seriously. Um, but I uh, gave him a small assignment in class, didn't finish it in class, and said, well, take care of it tonight. And, um, and you know, it's all of maybe two minutes worth of work, literally. So they come in the next day, ask them uh, if they had completed the, the work, and, um, and they said no. I asked, why not? And you know what the, the, the reason was? They didn't have time, they said. <laughs> That's exactly what I did. I just laughed. <laughs> As I say, the individual just got a good sense of humor, and I'm sure that they were just making a joke. You know, that's all, that's all that was taking place, right? You had an opportunity to say, to say yes, Pastor. <laughs> but I won't call you out right now. <laughs> Christians don't make excuses. No. Christians... Uh, look to the Lord for his grace to do what they've been called uh, to do. And, uh, and God gives that grace, empowers us by his spirit. And if we fall, we get back up again, don't we? Yep, we sure do. Christians don't make excuses why I can't. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And with regard to compelling people to come, yep, we do that. And though they may render excuses, why not, why not now? Um, but now, now's not the best time. They might try to turn it on you and say, you know, you're coming on too strong. I think that you're going to, you know, uh, and some, ever heard this? You know, if you come on like that, you're going to alienate people. You come on too strongly and you're going to turn people off to the, the message of the gospel. Ever heard people, have people respond that way to you? Yeah, you know. And um, they're trying to tell you, the Christian, how to act like a Christian. Yeah, I'm not buying that. I'm not buying that. I got Bible to back me. Amen? Amen. Amen. You, got, you got the Bible that tells you to compel them to come. You know the passage there in, <clears throat> in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, we're just fellowshipping a few minutes ago, uh, where God beseeches the lost by us to be reconciled to him. The marginal reference in my Bible says beg for beseech. God begs the lost by us. We, in Christ's stead, he's not down here doing it himself, is he? Nope. He sends his church, his disciples, to go and to compel them to come. And God begs the lost. It, it, uh, it, uh, I think when we look at that language, we should consider just how we're coming across. Are we pleading with begging, beseeching? Because that is language inspired by the Holy Spirit. You know, as we're getting started, I was blessed to hear, not only at our meeting, but these guys testify the same thing, that, that, um, that you all uh, at the meetings, 
several of you would have spoken to, uh, considering that you don't um, soft pedal the gospel. No, you speak speak plainly. Not um, try to water it down, compromise the presentation in any way. You don't uh, deliberately eliminate parts of the message that might be a little bit more offensive to some. No. You tell people, talk with people straight about they, their need to be born again. That was a blessing to hear. But it was also, you know, it was also said that, um, yep, folks, you all testified of uh, recognizing there's room to be, under some circumstances, some, some cases, more direct, more plain, more frank, more to the point, uh, where there's a plain communication we are talking life and death. Maybe you don't see it that way. You know, you're the per to the person that you're talking with, maybe they don't see it that way. Maybe there are just some things that they you know, would acknowledge they need to you know, look at a little bit more seriously. Make sure they're right with the big man upstairs. We're talking life and death. I set before you this day life and death. And that's what we're doing. We need to be led and directed by God's spirit in doing so. Amen? Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah, who wants to jump in here? Sure. Just uh, picking up on the comment that you made a moment ago where there's the thought that a direct presentation of the gospel message and the full gospel, including you're going to hell if you don't trust Jesus to save you from your sins, could alienate people. It just makes me think of the passage in John chapter 3 um, where Jesus says, I didn't come to condemn the world. Um, and then he goes on and says, you're condemned already. Mm -hmm. You know, some people hear that and they're like, yeah, that's the Jesus that I love. You know what I mean? The Jesus that didn't come to bring condemnation. And the clarity is you're already condemned, mm -hmm. which is not the popular message, the ear tickling message, uh, to use the biblical description that we talk about. And so the, the fear of alienating people is just right along the same line. They're already separated from God. We are... Well, to quote from 2 Corinthians 5, pleading with them to be reconciled to God. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, and he's committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. And um, I appreciate the reminder that this teaching is to, to do that and to do it with all uh, appropriate urgency and seriousness. Uh, Dad spoke to it again this morning. Uh, sometimes we let ourselves off the hook a little too easily, uh, thinking, well, you know, I, I did my job, I said my piece, and now hopefully, you know, the ball's in their court, and hopefully they'll believe it and, and make it to heaven. And we, we certainly believe that we cannot force people to believe in Jesus. You can't make somebody be a Christian. But as a good challenge to our hearts from the Holy Spirit, uh, asking, am I doing all that I could do? Not just have I satisfied the minimum requirement and I can say, okay, I checked the box and I did tell that person about Jesus. Am I sensitive to the Holy Spirit and doing all that I could do, all that the Lord would have me do to see this person reconciled to God? And it really does take, um, perhaps we'll discuss it again in a minute. We were talking some about it a second ago. It takes the leading of the Holy Spirit um, because, yeah, we... All that I can do doesn't necessarily mean, you know, tell them every day, you know, the, the same things. But uh, at least for me, I want to remember not to let myself off the hook too easily. I need to remember the goal. Mm -hmm. The goal is not me saying I was able to tell that person about the gospel. The goal is seeing them saved. I want to be available to be used by the Lord to do anything and everything that he'd have me do to see that accomplished. Mm -hmm. At the meeting I attended on Friday, several people spoke to uh, that, that point of how there may well have been times, conversations, where we've had uh, uh, opportunity to speak with individuals good and directly, a clear, 
thorough presentation of the gospel message, and then what? Mm -hmm. Then what? Well, they, if they didn't accept Jesus, again, the thinking can be, well, I, I told them. And that's true. But um, several people said they recognized that there's, you know, very possibly room for some follow-up ministry. Yep. Maybe going back again and having another run at it. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, not letting ourselves off the hook too easily mm -hmm. because uh, we've shared with them plainly once. Mm -hmm. That's great. But maybe there's, um, mm -hmm. maybe that person is still in your life uh, because God has put him there and there is yet more opportunity mm -hmm. that the Lord would have us take. Yep. Yeah. And, and just because all of us in this room did repent and believe the first time that you heard the gospel? Yeah. That's that doesn't point, mean yeah. that the person you're talking to necessarily not, not, not will. everybody does. Yeah. 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 If you're half asleep, that was a joke because not all of us did get it the first time, the second time, or the third time. And it's the Lord, in, in his mercy, um, allowed so us to continue, continue to hear it. And we're thankful for that. And Amen. we want to continue to to give the same to others. Mm -hmm. And I think with that, we also, we talked about also at our meeting about, um, you know, when, when you do get rejected, um, it's, another, it's another point of not just checking a box and saying, well, I told the person that they weren't interested and I'm just going to shake the dust off my, off my feet and, uh, and move on. But yeah, along that same line of whether someone, you had a, you had a great chance with someone and they really listened, but they didn't get the life of the Lord, or someone just flat out said, get out of my face. Um, that'd probably be the person that you'd be less likely to go back and follow up ministry because, yeah, all right, forget you, Jack. You're in an interest. And we talked a little bit about, some people brought about just being, you know, uh, just getting, taking it personal, you know, just sort of um, how, um, well, you don't, you, don't, you don't accept my Jesus, you don't love my Jesus, then forget you. Um, and just realizing that, um, as I, I spoke the script, the passage out of Second Samuel, where you know Samuel was concerned that they were rejecting him, mm -hmm. and um, because there was no king at the time in Israel, and Samuel was the prophet over the nation, and so he was sort of like the man, um, and the people, the Israelites wanted a king, and so Samuel took that personal as if they were rejecting him, and God said, "No, they're not rejecting you; they're rejecting me." And um, it's so, we're not being rejected when somebody doesn't want to hear the gospel or doesn't want to hear our Jesus. It, it's the Lord. That's who, who they reject. So we don't take it personal. Um, we understand that we are there as ambassadors for Christ, sharing, sharing the gospel, the good news of what has brought us life and salvation. Mm -hmm. yeah. you, all know, uh, you all know the, the scripture. Uh, uh, reasonably well and know that uh, there are passages that you could look to um, as justification for not going back and sharing again. You know, the Bible says that you're not to cast your pearls before swine or give that which is holy to dogs. Somebody says, you know, get out of my face, you know, take you, you and your Jesus and, you know, go you know where. And um, yeah, pearls before swine or that which is holy to the dogs. If they don't receive you, shake the dust off of your feet and go check with somebody else or try somebody else. Biblical basis for not going back to them, right? Yes? Yeah. Yeah, there's this Bible for that, isn't there? But there's also uh, pleading with people, isn't there? And, um, uh, of course, the testimony of the Scripture is that Jesus, the Lord sent prophets time and again to his people, over and over again. If you read the lives of some of the individual prophets, they prophesied for years to people, publicly, proclaimed directly, one-on-one, -on -one, challenging people, right? And so there, there is biblical justification uh, for persevering in this witness, isn't there? Yeah. So we don't want to be too quick to say, well, I shared the gospel with them. They didn't want to hear let them go to hell. No. We want to be looking to the Lord for what he would have us have to say. I know, it's, again, the teachings are such a blessing because 
pastor will share a passage, and you read it, and you write it down in your notes, but then you go back and read it again, slowly. And then you see more what, what's being revealed from the Lord, like, for example, Luke, the Luke 14 about the great banquet. Just like we were just talking a second ago, you present the gospel to a person once, and you think, okay, now it's all up to them. But if you read that, that parable, it says the servants went out multiple times, over and over again, not because they were compelled to do it on their own volition, because the Lord sent them mm -hmm. multiple times. And that really s struck me. I said, you know, Pastor mentioned in, in, in the teaching, does our witnessing convey the urgency? Does our witnessing also reflect the pleading that the Lord had in Luke 14 reg regarding the great, the great Supper, the Great Banquet? And that was really a challenge to me, is that am I truly, it's funny, in Matthew 5, verse 7 says, great, blessed are the merciful. These are people who are grieving at the condition of the lost. And when I share the gospel, do I leave that encounter with a grief in my heart that they didn't accept? Or do I just say, well, okay, I shared the gospel. The gospel doesn't return void. It's on them now. Mm -hmm. No, I should be just like these servants. Again, it's servants being sent by the master multiple times to go back and compel them to come. Mm -hmm. And again, if you read in, the, in Matthew 22, it's even more. The urging of the servants to continue to go back and back over and over again to not grow weary in well-doing. And that really spoke to me as just, we are the servants doing the master's bidding, and I'm to go back as often as it takes. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Another thing that I uh, wanted to speak to was <clears throat> the, <coughs> excuse me, the way that we have to contend with, with self in sharing the gospel. Um, sometimes... I, and, and probably all of us, are too mindful of things like, how will I be received? And plenty of times you anticipate some kind of, you know, rejection or uh, less than open response. And that kind of makes you not want to talk to the person about the Lord. Has anybody ever experienced that before? Okay, like three of us have. Um, well, so for the three of us that have. Uh, <laughs> It's very important to not think about yourself. Like the Bible says, don't look at your own things. We should be God conscious, and we should be more uh, aware of the need that the person that we're talking to has mm -hmm. than of, of ourselves and our, the way that we want to get a warm, fuzzy feeling from a, a nice reception where somebody's going to just listen to everything you say and thank you for it. Um, we go in obedience to the Lord because like Matthew 10 says, we don't fear the one who could, at worst, kill us. We fear God, who could kill us and send us to hell. And so I'm going to tell you about Jesus because of the Great Commission. The Lord has sent me to preach the gospel. And also, to the love of Christ, like he says there in 2 Corinthians 5. It constrains us because we thus judge that if one died for all, all were dead. This is wonderful news. And just as a fellow human being, you got to hear it. Um, those are the things that we should be mindful of, not... How are they going to receive me? What will this cost me? Plenty of times we're talking to a coworker, maybe even a superior on your job, a family member, and you're aware of some kind of consequence. I might not get invited to the next family gathering, or I might get fired from my job, or I might get ostracized in my place of work, or whatever it is. We need to think about the Lord who loved us and bought us, bought us with his blood, and we need to think about the need that the person has and not let our selfishness dominate the conversation. And I know sometimes I have to deal with feelings where it's, it's like I'm trying to um, appease two opposing sides, neither of which are really um, valid or really uh, legitimate demands. On the one hand, I feel like I need to meet the obligation that God has given to me to preach the gospel. And on the other side, I'm trying to not get this person upset at me. And that's not a fun way to share the gospel with people. It's not a biblical approach to it. Um, you're not just trying to, again, like we said earlier, appease God and see, God, I did it. And you're not trying to not get the person upset. We're wanting to just go right down the middle and speak truth, anointed by the Holy Spirit, that the Lord would have you share in the situation. And it, to do that, we need to be conscious of, of God uh, our love for him, our fear for him, and our love for the person that we're talking to, not 
how can I get through this in a way that will be as good for me as possible? We talked of, along those lines, we talked of how we are the people who see they're blind. Mm -hmm. we, we have the truth. They think they have the truth, but that's how mixed up they are. That's how blind they are. Um, uh, use a simple example. I mean, if you're talking to somebody and, um, and uh, whatever, you, you, you're telling them, you're talking to them about how uh, two plus two is four, and they say you're stupid, you don't know. Two plus two is not four, it's five. And you're stupid, you don't know. I mean, does that hurt, hurt your feelings? Do you get offended at that? Huh? Hey, what? You said two plus two is five? Don't you know? Uh, no, that, that's not, because uh, you know you're right. And they are wrong. Well, if somebody says you don't know what you're talking about, and you know, you're, you're, your religion is, 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 isn't right and true, and, and your mother dresses you funny, and whatever. I mean, it, uh, it shouldn't affect us, because we walk in the truth, and they don't know the truth. They think that they're alive and they're dead. They think that they see and they're blind. They think they understand uh, existence better than you do. And, uh, and they are dead wrong. So the fact that a blind person uh, criticizes me who sees for being blind, they, they're going to call me blind. Oh, I'm not blind, you're blind. No, 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 no. You really don't know what you're missing here. Now, I don't get offended at that. Mm -hmm. Say, Who else? Yeah. I was going to say also in the meeting we talked about um, just um, sharing with a true sincerity um, out of a real um, care and concern for someone. Because people pick up on that pretty easily. Mm -hmm. um, whether you really do care about them, care about their soul, um, about, um, about who they are. I mean, it's just like, again, it's going back to just not checking off a box, not just saying, hey, I did God, God led me to do this and so therefore I did it and no but just really being concerned for that individual people pick up on that um, when we're moving in the love of God and being led by the spirit and yeah people, people pick up on that I think many times you know if you're talking to somebody and they'll say oh that's that's, that's yeah my, my mom's been telling me about the Lord or, or somebody's been ministering to me you know and just really saying, man, that's that, just letting them know that's really the love of God. Amen. And then God has sent me now to you. He really wants you to know how much he loves you and how much you need to repent and change the way you've been living your life. Because, yeah, hell does await you. Mm -hmm. um, but just really out of a love. And, there's, you, can say, you can say the same thing two different ways. And one will be received and the other one not. And when you're moving in a true sincerity and a true love, then people do pick up on that. And... Um, and then we also got into, with that, just your response to people. Um, you know, the person who puts you off or, or just makes light of what you're saying. Well, you know, Jesus, Jesus turned it up a little bit in his sternness with those who, you know, were with the Pharisees and the Sadducees were, you know, always, he knew their hearts, but he, they were always testing them. And they were, he called them a brood of vipers or white sepulchers. With full of dead men's bones, there was there's the time for that, but that's not something that you'll pull out a big sledgehammer and hit somebody over the head because they, you know, they made a little fun of the gospel as you're you or you as you're sharing it. But it, if you're sharing out of the love and concern, that comes through to people. It's interesting. <clears throat> Every time we talk about the compassion for the lost, I think of before one of the basketball camps, pastor was teaching, and he reference 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, it says, But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not only the gospel of God, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. And on Wednesday here, I was talking to someone and asking them how they were doing. And we went through the, you know, how you doing? Fine, blah, blah, blah. But then I said, well, how are you really doing? You know why I'm asking you. And the person made an open confession that they need to change the way they think. 
And of course, they said it out of their own mouth. I didn't say you needed to repent. They said it themselves. So I said, so what are you truly saying? And he said, I need to repent of the ways I'm doing things. I said, well, great. Well, then, now, we've spoken a few times, and I've told you to give me a call or, or send me a text. You should do that. We need to talk further about this, not hoping that this would be the only encounter, because sometimes I, too, can be of the mindset one and done. Okay, here's the gospel. Here are the words. I've said it. It's all true. I'm done. Mm -hmm. Now it's on you. But I just, you know, I just said that, and we ended our conversation on Wednesday, and that was that. Well, Saturday morning, we left corporate prayer, and my phone was off doing prayer. And we get in the car, and there's a text from somebody I don't know. I'm thinking, thanks, Mr. Golden, for the conversation. Can you send me some verses? So I reply back, who is this? Because I don't know who it is. And they tell me who it is, and I said, be glad to. Now I have to step up again. See, this is the servant going back a second time. Just talk to them on Wednesday. Let them know of their need to repent and turn from their wicked ways. But now they're coming back to me for help again. So what do you do? You say, well, I told you what to do. You've got a Bible. Figure it out. Get it done. We'll see you. No. What you do is you go back a second time and continue to sow into them that they would be restored. And uh, that, was, that was a blessing to see that mm -hmm. take place where Man. you sow the word and it comes back, doesn't return void. Mm -hmm. Now the Lord asks you to come back, go back a second time. Mm -hmm. And I thought of Pastor Brady mentioning how Paul reads with the folks from the scriptures, three days. And you know, it might take three different sessions for me to do that, but whatever it takes to see that person mm -hmm. brought back to the Lord, it's, 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 it's worth it. It's worth it. Mm -hmm. I would, I would just want to, again, add my voice and underscore the uh, the points Steve and Stephen are making regarding a communication of the love of the Lord. Uh, Amen. We are not just fulfilling an obligation to pass out tracts. We're not satisfying our own ego, spiritually speaking, by uh, preaching at somebody. It's, uh, it's the love of Jesus Christ that compels and controls us. We have a genuine desire to see these souls rescued from hell and be able to spend forever with God, their maker, in heaven. Mm -hmm. And if you genuinely care about somebody, and, you know, uh, some people will respond to that care uh, almost immediately. They'll sense it. They'll pick up on it. They'll, they'll open up and want to talk. They can tell that you're sincere. Um, others, uh, they might uh, be just as, um, as, as, uh, as cold as, as uh, well, they, they might be quite cold toward a warm presentation of, of, of care and concern. But it's still alive and powerful. The love of God communicated through the word of God, uh, the Lord uses it. They can say, I'm not interested. Um, I, I can't help but think of that, uh, that testimony that Moody shared. <clears throat> mm -hmm. He's out on the streets and he was, uh, he had committed to sharing the gospel with, with somebody each day. Um, and uh, he recognized in this particular day that he hadn't shared the gospel with anybody. He's out on the streets there in Chicago and it's, uh, you know, nine or 10 at night and he's just looking for somebody to talk to. And a gentleman, businessman coming by and says, <clears throat> did you know where you'll spend eternity? Well, the guy, I guess it, 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 Moody had enough of a reputation there in town already that um, the guy recognized him. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, his response was, you know, get out of my face with your Jesus. Well, it was several days later, uh, this same businessman uh, comes to the office of another businessman with whom Moody had a good, close relationship, a Christian man. And, and he just, he walks in all disheveled and he says, I have not had a night's sleep in the last three nights. This, you know that Moody friend of yours? I was out in the streets, he says, comes up to me, he says, do you know where you're going to spend eternity? And I have not been able to rest a moment since then. <laughs> How powerful is the word of God? Sometimes people have put you off, say, I'm not interested. But the, the, the truth is so powerful. And it just, this guy, of course, just continued to haunt him until he surrendered his life as all to the Lord. Yeah. And uh, 
when we're communicating the truth and the love of the Lord, that's like nothing else people encounter. Yeah. How often we say, this is not a philosophy. This is living truth from the heart of God. God is the one that's really speaking through us Amen. to that person. It's God that's communicating that. So my son died for your sins and I'm ready to pardon you. That's God talking to them. And that's the way they hear it. Amen. We're sharing the love of Jesus Christ from the heart of a very loving God. Amen. And so we compel them to be reconciled. I just want to add also about praying. Praying for opportunities. Um, you know, it's really, you know, in general, yes, praying for opportunities, but also opportunities for individuals that, you know, whether it's coworkers or people in the neighborhood, people that, you know, that are on your heart, God's put it on your heart, maybe someone that you have shared with before, but really praying for an opportunity that God would give you, you know, in his own, because God orchestrates things well, and um, just for you to be able to share more with that person. Amen. I'll share a good testimony. Right along those lines, a simple one, but... Um, it was um, day before yesterday, and uh, in the morning I was, I was just mindful, and I haven't shared the gospel with anybody um, in several days and just uh, wanted to. But um, sometimes I, I don't leave the premises, and I'm, I'm between the house and, and work. <laughs> it's a pretty short commute. <laughs> and... Um, <clears throat> But Lord, you know, just I'm interested in just sharing the gospel, being, being the salt and light you've called me to be. Well, it was a blessing. I was out in the parking lot there. It was around, uh, what time do all the Muslims come to? It was about one o'clock. Guy pulls on in here. And, uh, and I'm out there and he says, is this the mosque? I said, nope, this is a, a Christian church. And um, mosque is across the lane. But you've come to the right place. <laughs> <laughs> And they had a good conversation. The, the man um, was in no hurry to leave. And um, the Lord provided. And I, and I mention that just because um, uh, as I'm talking with him, I was quickly reminded that this is the very thing that I'd asked Father for that morning, that he would provide an opportunity. And here the guy just pulls right on in, you know, <laughs> and a good opportunity to talk with him about his soul. Um, as we pray and ask, the Lord will open up doors. He does. He's, um, he's the one that desires to use us as, as salt and light. And as we're looking to him to be used by him, he will lead us and guide us and give us those good opportunities. Mm -hmm. Yep. So yes, um, Raid was his name, R-A-I-D. And he said he might come on out. Yeah, yeah. Talked with him. We exchanged numbers. And he said that he might come on out and visit. Oh. Palestinian. Um, uh, grew up in Bethlehem. Yeah. Nice. So I thought of maybe, um, you know, seeing if any way I could get um, uh, Walid or Ronnie. Walid would be a good one to hook him up with. Uh, Walid, uh, the Zeroos are Palestinian. You guys know that, don't you? They're not just Arabs. <laughs> it's all just Arabs, right? <laughs> They're Palestinian. Um, their dad, uh, well, they didn't grow up. They were born here in America. Um, but their dad um, grew up in um, Ramallah, um, a, a town there in, in, in Israel. And um, so, yeah, they're... There are Palestinians. They speak the same language. So. Who else? Anybody else? No, that, we'll call that good. Um, that'd be good, and we'll um, uh, get down to Virginia for some good fellowship with the saints there. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the privilege of being workers together with you. Help us to be all the more mindful of being your ambassadors, your representatives. Help us. You use our mouths, our hearts, to plead with lost souls to be reconciled to you. That's your desire. You're not willing that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. And you're a long-suffering God, very long-suffering. Help us to be long-suffering. Give us a greater compassion. Help us to persevere. Help us to pray. And we do ask, O oh Lord God, that through this ministry, through our witness, in our families and in our neighborhoods and on our jobs, 
through outreaches like we're, we're conducting, O oh Lord God. Souls would be one into your kingdom and added to this body of believers. Yes, Father. We ask these things in Jesus' name. We ask your blessing upon our time of fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Sterling as well. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 We'll be sure to greet one another in the love of the Lord. God's peace go with you all.